The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Pangon Australian Equities Fund uh, webinar for September. Uh, I have a few things to talk about. I'll be going for approximately 20 minutes. And if you have any questions, please type them in, into the facility offered, and I will attempt to answer all of them at the end of the session. Um, so, if we start the presentation, um, as you can see, uh, the team hasn't changed. There's still the five of us. Uh, Anton and myself started this business uh, almost 11, or well, just over 11 years ago, and we have very competent, uh, we're very competently assisted by both Mark and Chris, and a more recent um, addition to our team, although she's been with us for several years now, is Stephanie, who is our dealer. Um, and so she actually goes out and either buys or sells the shares um, that make up our portfolio. Um, it's a very experienced team and um, very, very comfortable that we have enough brain power and experience to do what we've set out to do. Um, we go to the next. Okay, if we go to the next page, um, we have not changed our, um, our focus. Uh, for 11 years, we have unbroken capital preservation for every single financial year. Um, and we are very, very focused on achieving a reasonable real return, which equates to the risk-free rate um, plus 6%, which currently equates to approximately 7 uh, Since inception, the fund has delivered uh, comfortably above 10%, which is, um, that's drive away, no more to pay, which is comfortably above um, our target. Uh, as you can see from this slide, we attempt to show how we've had a positive financial year uh, in every single year since inception. Uh, importantly, we, no one is more aware than I am that during fiscal year 19, uh, we did not cover ourselves in glory. We'd had a positive year, which I'm very relieved to say we, we had. And subsequent to that, um, we think validation has occurred with um, a real return to 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 rationality, um, and the portfolio has performed exceptionally well. Um, as you would have seen during August, we had a positive month in spite of very difficult reporting season uh, for the market and, and a very nice um, preceding month of well over 3%. So we're, we're comfortable that um, in, in several years we'll look back at 2018 uh, sorry, 2000, yeah, 2018 calendar year and say that was a blip. Um, and we, we're very comfortable that we'll demonstrate that. Uh, volatility remains low. Um, our puts and our cash holdings and our focus on strong after-tax cash earnings yields is really um, putting us in a very, very good place. Um, the downside protection, as I've discussed in 2018, uh, was not well managed. Uh, we feel that it was probably about 90% the environment and about 10% our own mistakes. We've remedied the mistake. We have gone through every single company that we own in detail. Um, we do feel that valuations during that period were an aberration um, and we've been subsequently validated. An overall broader view um, reflects our fund performance. I can comfortably say that as of yesterday, every single investor at every single entry point has made money with us. Um, and this is particularly comforting after a particularly rocky period during, um, during the last quarter of December. We remain comfortably above our medium term target, which is risk-free plus six, and uh, very comfortable that the portfolio is um, configured to both manage the downside and achieve this goal. Uh, many of you have seen this slide before. There's a time to be disciplined and a time to be brave. Uh, we're very comfortable in the fact that during August, we demonstrated this quite comfortably. Um, our large put or insurance position stood us in good stead by keeping us psychologically sound. And we will 
able to acquire some very nice new holdings, which I'll go through in a, new de in a bit of detail, um, and use up some of that cash uh, to good effect. We remain focused on um, our investment risk. I do understand better than most, I think, that tracking error is not investment risk, but instead it is our business risk. We will remain focused on investment risk, and that is preserving capital and making sure we get enough returns for the risk we take on. So, um, our beliefs have not changed in the 11 years that we manage money. I'm going to go through this quite quickly because I think most of you have seen this before. But particularly the information arbitrage happens at a granular level of detail um, has been quite relevant to the fund, in the, particularly in, over the last two months. What we've seen over the last two months is almost a bifurcation in returns. During July, it was a very robust time. Um, we spent most of the month selling or trimming positions. Um, the only acquisition we made, the only way we deployed cash was to buy a significant position in um, six month puts on the All Lords. That was the only acquisition we made during July. During August, paradoxically, we, um, we were well protected as the market fell away by those puts. We started the month with well over 20% in cash. We realized some of the puts and deployed some of that cash into some weak, um, very weak share prices, particularly in our existing holdings, but also started new positions in NAB and clean away. Um, and we ended the month on approximately 16 or 17 percent in cash. So I don't want to make too much of this, but but the ability to reach across the abyss, which is our, our term for it, and actually um, buy things when it looks like there's blood on the streets is, 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 is non-trivial. And it's something we take very, very seriously. And it's backed up by enormous amounts of hard work. And <laughs> if I can just add quite a bit of courage, because when markets are falling, it's very hard to do this. Having puts in position in, in place and significant cash reserves, which for us is a risk-free option to buy value if and when it emerges, is exceptionally important. Um, and for us, the information arbitrage certainly happens at a granular level of detail. We remain benchmark unaware. Um, we have absolutely no problem staying in cash. In fact, the cash we do have is exceptionally short dated, and it's between zero and three months. Um, we're very tax aware. Binary outcomes, even 10 bangers, are not for us. We like to buy toilet paper and toothpaste type businesses. We have about a billion dollars of fund. We think that's the right number. The fund remains in soft, soft close, which means that we are not actively marking, marketing the business to any new clients, whereas existing clients can continue to put their money into the fund. And we're absolutely in the business of preserving capital and making money. We are not in the business of beating the market. The Capital Preservation Toolkit has been fairly active of late. So we have a defensive bias in the portfolio. As I've mentioned earlier, we're focused on toilet paper and toothpaste type businesses. We have the ability to stay in cash where we can't find investments that justify the risk. But as importantly, we have shown the ability to deploy that cash when and if the opportunities arise. So over the last two weeks, three weeks, we have deployed 7% uh, of the portfolio, which is $70 million into the market. Um, we make active use of currency as a second derivative to, to manage some of the risks. So when the Aussie dollar looks frothy, we will buy or actively look for non-Aussie dollar earnings streams, which have provided us with some hedge. We have a very disciplined investment process and of late, for the first time in three to four years, we, uh, we used put options. So maybe just a quick pricey of our put option process. We look for a trifecta 
of events. The first one is we like or we get nervous when everything goes up in a straight line. Secondly, if the market itself looks quite expensive. And thirdly, paradoxically, in that environment, if you also get very cheap volatility or vols, which is how their price puts, that trifecta allows us to buy protection at an attractive price. We found that since the um, this, the uh, Liberal government uh, re-election, that the market took off. And we felt that, that large swathes of the, of the market were being priced at full or very full um, valuations. We started nibbling at puts, six month puts, 5% out the money. It was over an extended period, so we bought two series, one maturing in November and one maturing in December. We hope and pray that we tear those puts up as worthless because it's seen as insurance, not as a way to make money. Importantly, it keeps us financially whole if the market falls away and psychologically whole. And unfortunately, this played out very well in August, where we retained a positive return for most of August and finished in positive territory, as well as allowing us to then start deploying some of the additional cash we had on our balance sheet. So investment process remains the same. Idea generation, he who looks under the most rocks wins. And between the four analysts, myself included, we have spent particularly August seeing an enormous amount of companies meeting with management, doing a fortune of reading um, and debating where and if opportunities present themselves. We have assessed the investment opportunities. We've built our models. Um, we've sat with the management teams. We've, we've argued and debated with them who has the power in every stakeholder relationship that the company has with its stakeholders, its customers, its suppliers, its competitors, etc. Government regulators, its staff, virtually every stakeholder. And then if we can find a good business run by competent management at the right price with a good balance sheet at the moment, because we're worried about the distortions building up, then we're happy to buy those businesses. That's just another look of the various factors that we consider um, um, and how we go about it. So a performance update. As you've seen, the March quarter, so the bounce back, when growth stocks, particularly the technology stocks, had a very sharp bounce, as well as REITs and resources, we were left a little bit behind. In the June quarter, we had our validation moments where value started to reestablish itself, um, and we did exceptionally well. We're very, very happy to say that July and August have both been positive months for us, um, and we're very well placed going forward. And then cash levels, as we've started to deploy cash, have started to come down. Calendar year to date performance. Um, uh, apologies, you can't see this, but I'm just going to move some of this down. Um, financial year to date. Um, so that's the two months since the start of um, start of from the first of July has gone very well for us, and in fact we're up almost at twenty percent for the calendar year. Now we need to do that because we had a lousy end to the financial to the calendar year two thousand and eighteen. But essentially what I'm trying to show you is that our numbers um, have bounced back as a result of us holding our nerve and being validated by the positions that we've owned. If we then go through um, where that performance has come from, and we've tried to break it up again to show how we've categorized where our weightings are. Private health insurers have been a very big gaining area for us. Um, as has healthcare, diversified financials, which is essentially critical, um, and smart salary. And then we've done particularly well out of some other sectors. We understand that in fuel retailing, so those are our holdings in Viva Energy and Caltex, as designated by the orange bars, has not done that well for us in August. 
We understand what's going on. We think that the big guys, Caltex and Viva, are cleaning up the industry by making it very tough for the independents. And we think that we'll start to emerge as a much better industry with very large benefits for us as shareholders. Those stocks are particularly cheap. So three main themes, if I can. We feel that the weight of money from low interest rates are forcing investors to search for yield by going up the risk curve into other asset classes. We know that cash rate and the term deposits as a result are offering returns below the current inflation rate. We know that alternative asset classes are at multi-decade highs and I would include property prices, fixed interest, infrastructure, um, and a range of other assets. We know that this makes equities look attractive on a relative basis. And the paradox that I'm referring to versus long bonds is that long bond rates are predicting a problem coming, a recession, whereas equities are not. And that's the paradox, who do you believe? We think that these moves have been exaggerated by a movement of assets out of active managers, there's you know, funds like myself, into passive funds. And this has occurred in size, in scale, by the institutional investors. Now, we don't have a cent of institutional money, but we have seen that happen across the industry. And then we have a large cohort of very good businesses run by very good management teams which have valuations which appear too high, and I've put that's a euphemism. They are eye-wateringly expensive. And we think that even though they're very good companies, we think the valuations being ascribed to them are way too high. And so this is a main distortion. These are the distortions that are being created, and we're steering clear of them. Secondly, we've established We've identified opportunities while maintaining discipline. And we've re-established a position in aristocrat leisure. Um, and we've established positions in Dexas and Evolution, and they're in red because we've sold those positions already, as the market gave us 15 to, in the case of Evolution, a 50% gain. And we've bought positions in Mervac, NAB, and CleanAway. And then we've trimmed our positions substantially in ResMed and Credit Corp. And paradoxically, we've been able to buy them back on weakness and then sold them again. We're effectively using our, utilizing our capital preservation toolkit. Cash holdings now at 17%, and we still have a significant position in puts um, and have been looking at, at actually increasing that given the way the markets bounce back. Um, but vols are still too high. This slide is the one that probably keeps me awake at night. It's the first time I've managed to find a 230-year time series on the cost of money. So one of the things I often say that if I need to work out whether I can buy a company or not, I only need to know three things. <coughs> Excuse me. One is the quantum of future cash flows coming from that business. Two is the certainty of the future cash flows coming from that business. And thirdly, what is the cost of money? And for the first time in my investment career, I'm probably spending more time thinking about what is the cost of money? What is the sustainable cost of money in this environment rather than the future cash flows and certainty of cash flows from the businesses? And the reason for this is, as you can see from that chart, it's a chart giving the cost of money globally using the 10-year US government bond as a proxy. And what is bizarre is that our whole generation has been educated by an environment of ever-decreasing interest rates. More, most importantly, to give the context of where we are at this point in history, is that the cost of money has never been lower in nominal terms in 230 years. And we know that long duration assets go up in value when the cost of money goes down. 
And unfortunately, the reverse is true. And so the inflection point for this bull run end can be a host of things, but essentially it might all boil down to the same thing, which is the change in the trajectory of the cost of money. And so for us, the strategy we've adopted to address this issue is a, is, is a three-pronged approach. One is to have lots of firepower for when opportunities present themselves and the courage to do that. Secondly, it's to have a portfolio of assets that are toilet paper and toothpaste type businesses run by competent management, have pricing power to deal with any kind of inflation or inflection points, and they must have decent after-tax cash earnings yields. We will not be owning businesses on one or two percent after-tax cash earnings yields. For us, it needs to be approximately six percent to start, growing to ten percent in five years. And we retain this discipline. That's the second. The third thing we've done is to have an overarching put strategy built up during a time when vols were cheap and acting as our insurance. I've got a little illustration and I won't be going for much longer, but a quick illustration of there seems to be no limit to the valuations placed on companies that have a sexy tech strategy with a charismatic senior management team. And so what we've done on this chart is we've laid out, some of you have seen it before, the PEs on the left-hand y-axis. The 20 PE for us is already expensive. When you get up to the 50, we've had to truncate it to include the 100 club. And we've noticed that there's a host of companies that we are struggling to wrap our heads around the valuations. And it's this bifurcation of valuations that is creating a lot of pain for those who are tempted to style drift. Because good companies continue to come out with good results, which means their valuations become more and more stretched. We feel that the elastic band continues to stretch. And when it stops stretching, it snaps or snaps back. And we've seen that in spades in some of the companies already. IDP was firmly above in the 100 club and has come down to only a 45 PE one year out, um, which is still expensive for us. We think it's, don't get me wrong, these are great businesses run by great management. We just struggle to wrap our heads around the valuations. I've also had a lot of people say, well, Ed, how serious is this issue? Well, those of you who've seen this, this slide before, it used to be 70 bill, now it's 83 billion on an average forward PE of 155. And we've taken out some of the 2000 PEs and all the NAs to ensure that we've got the right number to indicate how expensive this group of companies is. Oops, I think I've gone too far. So if I, um, if I indicate again the level or the bifurcation in valuations, these are PEs for industrials and financials dragged up by that $83 billion very high multiple businesses. And then our portfolio. So how have we managed this? Essentially, defensive for us is economically insensitive, well diversified geographically and currency wise businesses run by competent management with lots of power and good balance sheets. And those are all the light yellows. We think that the ones in blue are the same, but the widgets they sell are money. And so we have to think about interest rates differently. And then discretionary retail, we have 8.6% in that area in companies where we don't have to guess the economic cycle in order to make money. So we think we found best in class leading position with lots of power companies that are trading at very attractive after tax cash earnings yields. Um, you'll notice we have no resource companies. 
we have a tiny, tiny position in a commodity service provider, but we've stayed away from that area. Our net exposure to options is 0.4%, but our notional exposure is closer to 8 or 9%. And that gives us quite a bit of protection. Now, I've used up my time, that's 11.25, and so what I'm going to do is throw it open to questions, if I may. And so if you, um, just a reminder to type questions. Um, um, and I've got a recommendation from a company we've been looking at. Uh, we thought we understood it. Um, it's a company called iSign. So he's suggesting that we add it to our list of um, crazy valuations. Um, I think it had revenue of seven and a half million dollars. It now has a market cap of one point seven billion dollars as of today. Um, so thank you, Darren, for that um, for that recommendation. We certainly will add it. Only problem is it doesn't have any earnings yet, so it'll it'll have an infinite PE. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. I know um, somebody said to me in this period of very high, this was a question that, that turned up before the presentation, and it was quite a good one, have said that if you're so worried about um, valuations and you're so worried about the cost of money, how do you find things to buy and how do you have your portfolio 80, you know, 84 percent invested? And I think it's just worth spending some time. So how did we find CleanAway? How did we find NAB? Um, how did we find Mervac? I think CleanAway is something I might just start with. Um, it's a business that we've always liked, very defensive business, exceptionally strong operating leverage and exceptionally strong management. Essentially what they do is they deal with waste um, and they manage um, waste both for the councils and for businesses. They have scale and very strong operating leverage. We've always liked it. We always thought it was too expensive. They came out during reporting season with numbers which showed that their earnings only grew 14% instead of the 20% that the market expected. The company fell 20%. Um, we saw management. We cons confirmed um, our investment thesis that the operating leverage is intact and the lower earnings is as a result of them reinvesting in their business. Um, and therefore the future cash flows will be very strong. As a result, we were able to take advantage of one of the bigger fund managers in Australia deciding to dump the stock um, to establish a position and we are continuing to add to it. So, um, if there are no further questions, uh, I might leave it there. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, I hope you find it useful, and I look forward to speaking to you again uh, either during the, the following days, the following weeks, or at the next webinar.